Dad, it'll cause a bloodbath. We don't know that'll happen, and we have to move on. Someone should try it. Make it work. Where I am now, I don't know if it would still be possible. I'm getting older, and I'm not accomplishing anything I need to. Do what you know you should do. Jason, focus on your studies, working with your father, and don't let anything distract you. Opinions, viewpoints, and beliefs presented on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the management, the affiliates, and broadcast partners, or the sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Gamfest Radio, the radio you can see. Welcome, everybody, and you can see what I spent all afternoon doing. I made a new intro for 2022 Scarefest TV. The original broadcast date, by the way, January 21st, 2022. Just getting things rolling for Scarefest 14, The Awakening. And we were discussing before the show, we still don't know what The Awakening is. We don't, we need art. Brandon, we need art. Anyway, our guest tonight, and by the way, well, okay, yeah, we'll go with David first. David, welcome to the show. Uh, David Weaver is the filmmaker behind our best kill of our 2021 film festival. Uh, the Last Frankenstein, that was the clip you saw a minute ago. Uh, Chad Harlan is my lovely and talented co-host tonight. And, 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 and yes, everybody. I'm not wearing a Hawaiian shirt because everything is new because we're we're revamping the show format because we've got new intros. We're doing all this new shit. I'm going to put my collar up. Chad, you remember when we used to think that was sexy back in the early 80s? I do. You had to wear two of them, though. You couldn't have one shirt on. You had to have two collars. No, nah, I'm a country boy. We had we had one shirt with one collar, but we did it really we did it really really well. Uh, everybody, we do have a celebrity announcement tonight at the uh, thirty minute mark. Um, we're gonna be playing around with some stuff tonight, so if I jack it up, yeah, it's like business as usual. Now let's um let's see, uh, it's all good stuff. Now let's uh, go ahead and bring David in. David, welcome to the show once again. Um, now. First question, and I warned you out off, right off the bat. Why is your film company named after a lizard? Uh, well, thank you guys for having me on. Um, yeah, Gila Films, that came about because when I was a kid and I made short films and any kind of projects with my friends, that's just the name I gave them was Gila Films. It was because I... I pretty much just took it from the giant Gila monster, which is like a 50s B-movie I liked a lot. Oh, okay. And then when we... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I like the actor in that movie a lot. And then when we finally went to do uh, The Last Frankenstein, I was like, all right, I need to come up with a real name for my company, or, as such as it is. And so I wrote a whole list of uh, on a whiteboard, 
and I wasn't satisfied with any of them. I was running out of time, and I was like, screw it. We're sticking with Hila Films. So that's, that's how it came, and that's how it stayed. Now, just so you know, the first 10 seconds of that answer, I was sure that I was going to come back with, well, you just pulled it out of your butt. But now you you know uh, that actually makes sense. That has a connection, and um, and and I got a compliment tonight, everybody. I was the first person that thought to ask how to um to pronounce his movie um, company. Everybody gets it wrong. It was kind of the worst name to pick because after a while, everybody's like, "How's How's Gila Films? How's yeah. Gila Films? How's Gila Films?" I'm like, eh, all right. you know, I I did I did stick with the hard G on it. Uh, I, I but I I knew I for some reason when I was a kid I was a fan of Gila monsters. I have no idea why. I've never seen one up close. I've never been around one, but it, it made I, so it, it made sense to me. Anyway, um, now the one thing, of course, your reward for the film. Um, which uh, is it was wasn't all in your wheelhouse because you actually had somebody do some of this stuff for you, but the best kill. Now everybody, our best kill in in our in our film festival, basically it will always be. I I can't imagine this moving away from uh, practical effects, and the with uh, it was uh, around five minute mark to six and a half minutes, two in a row. Is it too much of a spoiler to tell for them to tell for? Because this actually, the one I want to tell is not even the one that won. It's the one that oh, really? led oh. up to the one that won. Oh yeah, you can tell. It's, it's okay. It's, yeah. The uh, at the, roughly it. the five minute mark in the movie, um, Frankenstein's monster. I won't call him Frankenstein because that's a dude's last name. Um. <laughs> Rips a guy's arm off and beats him to death with it. There, I said it. And then that wasn't True. even yep. the one that won, but I think it might have it, it caught everybody. It made everybody stare at the screen a minute, so they really caught the next one, which was just totally awesome. Um, shout out uh, to to you for having that in your film. Uh, tell us, you mentioned the uh, your special effects guy. I, I want you to give him a plug. Yeah, uh, Jared Baylog is his name, and he did. Uh, when we set out to do the film, we wanted everything to be practical effects because we, you know, I really have a, a love for the vintage aesthetic of that. And um, he, he, you know, used all the latex, the fake blood, and everything, uh, and really went to town with it. He did a great job with uh, creating the creatures, both creatures in the film, and all the kills. And you know, he's really. We were very fortunate to come across him when we did because he's gone and saw like a lot of great success he was just doing the uh working on the effects team on black friday the bruce campbell movie he's done some stuff down the city with marvel but um it was yeah it was very important we we had a conversation with him we want this to look like a snuff film right we don't want it to be cartoonish we want it to when you see someone get killed to really think it's happening and that's how we wanted to come across so he, he really nailed it the um that's funny you described it that way because most of the kills i wouldn't call them run of the mill but i mean they're Typical TV friendly kills. In other words, the yeah. the the dead part, the the blood's almost after the fact. Um, you know. Right. Yeah. Now, yeah. on that topic, before I toss it over to Chad, I do want to know, since you, you know, uh, this was your baby, about how much do you figure you spent on fake blood? Because there was a lot of blood strewn around the set. Now, I don't know how much that part. Came to, I mean, the effects were probably. One of the biggest parts of the budget. Yeah, definitely. It, during production, it was effects and then, um, you know, hotels and food, that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it uh, took up a big chunk with all the, uh, the creatures and the gore, especially the creatures. Those, those okay. Them. Yeah. I, I can see the makeup effects and all that, but I'm just, I, I was watching that movie. I watched it again today and, I, and I'm sitting there thinking, if you use red dye number five and Cairo syrup for the blood, which I don't know that he did. But if you you're still talking in the hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars, because it's just everywhere once there's a kill. Chad, over to you. Hey David, it's great hey, to man. talk to you. I will uh I will comment on one of the things you just said. You said you like the vintage uh aesthetic of practical effects, but watching your movie, it really didn't come across as vintage. It was really mm -hmm. well done. It really fit the uh, the modern horror movie aesthetic. So oh, thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll give another compliment of how well the effects and the makeup were in this movie. Oh, um, but let's take you back a little bit. You said that uh, that Gila Films came from uh, your 
your youth when you were making movies and stuff. Tell us a little bit how you got uh, one interested in the horror aspect and that genre, and two, just how you kind of developed your love for making movies. Yeah, no, I was always since uh, as long as I can remember a big movie fan, and uh, everyone in my family had different interests, different genres. Uh, but my uncle and aunt, who I would go to their house to you know sleep over on the weekends. They were really into uh, horror movies and science fiction movies, and that's that's where I got my uh, interest in that genre. And uh, eventually, in high school, you know, I realized that you know I had a really fertile uh, sense of creativity, and I really liked movies. I was like, why don't I put these together and try to actually go into filmmaking? So I did a, a little bit of study at college. Uh, went to a, a local college where I got my communications degree. Studied at a couple film schools, and I just did that you know classic thing when you don't live near a filmmaking hub is once in a while a bigger production will come into the town and you kind of get a, a, a work on that as like an intern or a PA and then there's local filmmakers who you get uh, involved with on, on a more um, hands-on level and that's really how I came across Jay Leonard who produced our movie and who's a director in his own right and we worked together on several projects and then just you know I directed some short films in school and on my own but eventually I really just you know wanted to do feature the feature works what really appeals to me so that's what kind of led me to do the last Frankenstein is my first feature. And you, uh, you were the writer on this too, weren't you? Yeah. Yep. So, uh, kind of where did your inspiration come from for the, uh, for the topic? No, it just actually completely was not something I was thinking about doing. I had a different idea in my head for my, uh, for the first film. And then just the, the words, the last Frankenstein popped randomly into my head. And I was kind of curious what that meant, you know, and it started snowballing into, okay. Imagine if, you know, the basic germ of the idea was imagine if you have the last descendant of the Frankenstein family, he lives in modern day, but unlike all the Frankensteins you see in movies, he doesn't have tons of wealth and a giant, you know, uh, you know, be a beautiful baroness who's going to marry and, you know, access to everything, you know, Matt, he's almost kind of like approaching like a, a midlife crisis. He doesn't, you know, he's a guy of not the best means, but he still has that passion and that desire to accomplish, uh, you know, the family experiment. And from there, it just it really came together really quickly. Just you know, who would he use as modern day grave robbers? Well, you know, he would he turns in the movie to these paramedics who are also dealing drugs. You know, just little things like that all really kind of came together pretty quickly after I, I kind of got the initial nut crack. I think you did, like I said, I think you did a great job with it, and it, it really came together with the and became a great project. So uh, thank you, uh, kudos on that. Um, Thanks. You kind of touched on that uh, horror movies were something that you enjoyed with your uh, with your uncle when you go over there. Uh, mm -hmm. What kind of uh, what kind of movies were you drawn to? Uh, well, when I was really young, I can remember there was like these half a dozen films that we watched a lot, and it was like the original thing from the fifties. Uh, you know, a uh, couple of the Universal monster movies, um, Frankenstein nineteen seventy with Boris Karloff. Uh, and just over time, you know, I've, I've always been interested in all kinds of genres, you know, dramas, documentaries, westerns, everything. But if there's kind of like a wheelhouse that everything falls into, it's kind of like anything cinema from the mid, the late 50s to the mid 80s. And so if you look into there specifically of horror, you know, over the years, I really just became a big fan of like a lot of the stuff like, um, you know, Suspiria or Messiah of Evil, just a lot of the, uh, both the classic ones, but also a lot of the, the exploitation drive-in ones. And really just you know i i almost feel out of out of step with modern day like i feel like i should have just been living in that time period that, that 50s to 80s time period so it's just like secondhand nature to want to film in locations that look like that or have people dress like that it's not even trying to be retro it's just what i i like naturally and so if anything i think that's the biggest impact from you know uh my my love for film is that i kind of cultivated this, this sense of this time period and the way films were shot back then and which includes you know using practical effects and in the saturation of the color shooting on film the film grain look so all those kind of things kind of came together i think the, the most and really informed the way i make movies well like i said it turned it, it can't it all came together to uh to produce a, a great movie in the last frankenstein we're up to a break so let's toss over to that and we'll be right back in a few minutes Everyone is talking about CBD oil and it seems like almost everyone is using it. 
The research is ongoing, but the apparent health benefits are overwhelming. If you're going to use CBD products though, what brand should you buy? First, find out where the hemp was grown. Imports are flooding the market. How potent is it? Look for a brand that plainly states its concentration on the label. And look for full spectrum CBD. This means the oil contains CBD and all the other cannabinoids, terpenes, and nutrients that are found in the entire cannabis plant. Look for Blue Leaf CBD oil. Blue Leaf Naturals is a Kentucky Proud company. They use only Kentucky-grown hemp, supporting Kentucky farmers and businesses. Visit their website at blueleafcbd.com now and use the code SMILE at checkout for free shipping. And welcome back, everybody, to Scarefest TV. Keno Reeves is set to star in a big-budget adaptation of The Devil in White City, based on the 2003 book about H.H. H. Holmes, often cited as America's first serial killer. The story follows Daniel Burnham, the architect behind the 1893 World's Fair, and Holmes, who is looking to build his infamous, infamous Murder Castle Hotel. It's still unclear at this time which role Reeves will play in the series. The series is currently in development through Hulu and will be executive produced by Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, okay, now, David, um... On your film, um, now this I, we're going to talk a little inside baseball stuff. I want to know how you kind of came up with some of this. The um, okay, now writing it. Okay, I'm going to say that the film is exactly what I expect out of an independent production, except for really good kills. Uh, most of them can't pull pull that off. Um, the dialogue, I'll say, was minimalist. Um, it, you know, words, you didn't overwrite the characters. I see that a lot. But the one thing that really caught my eye, now was this, I'm going to assume this was all directing because deadpan is too strong of a word. But none of the characters really get excited. There's always one actor in an independent film that is just, off the charts from everybody, off the page from everybody else. Yeah. But everybody in this film, was that based on, now, I don't want to say on the talent. I want to, was that based on the character? Is that the way you envisioned it when you wrote it? But all of the characters were really just too fucking calm sometimes. There, I said it. <laughs> yeah, no, that was uh, intentional for like, especially like the character of Jason Frankenstein, who is the last Frankenstein, that he is this kind of person who, really keeps everything inside and really tries to control his emotions. Like you see in the film, there's only a couple times where, you know, he gets close to losing his cool. And, you know, by extension of that, you know, I, I didn't want it to be uh, too obvious, but, you know, you look at the, the paramedics, you know, the main paramedic who, for those who haven't seen the film, uh, it's a character named Randolph, who's a paramedic who's also dealing drugs and he basically becomes his, his grave robber. Well, he's also kind of like almost like a mirror image of Jason Frankenstein. So he's kind of like a similar person, more street smart than book smart, but a similar personality where he's also very, very um, internal and very much in control of himself. And so that was definitely an intentional thing to have some of those characters like that. I think some of the characters like Barb, who's the woman he comes across at the restaurant, the actress and his girlfriend are, are more emotive. And, you know, but to your point, yeah, there, there is no... Um, uh nobody's at 10 right no one's <laughs> no one's playing to the back the back of the theater and that's 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 you know i i like that kind of more restraint uh less is more kind of approach and i think again that kind of comes from uh that time period i like i think that was something you saw a lot more of back then um and i i it appeals to me but it was also kind of needed for these characters too so. yeah the uh the to describe it everybody the lead character okay the, the idea behind the character was that he was would you say is disappointed in life the right in other words he was yeah he's frustrated yeah, fr yeah frustrated, he's frustrated with, with life. life yeah and um yeah. he it comes through i'll just put it that way it comes through mm -hmm. all the way through the movie 
even to the point, okay, at the beginning of the movie, you understand, okay, he's a doctor. He doesn't think he's where he should be by now. You know, so, you know, and he's, he's, his, his girlfriend or whatever she is isn't living up to his expectations, however you want to look at it. But then, as the movie goes on, there's this, there's a couple moments in the film where it's just like, oh, now this. And, uh, and, and, and I, and I, I, I like the way it was played. I, I just wanted to put that out there, whether, um, okay. in a, in a, so I'm giving you credit for it. Now, the Thank one you. character in the movie that I thought, the, 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 I'll, I'll call her, I forget which, uh, what her character was, the, the, the motorcycle chick. I thought she oh, was a little yeah. too accepting. In other words, when you when you're dealing with a character like Frankenstein's monster, every now and then somebody ought to lose yeah. their shit. That's that's me in the real world, and um, and she, I actually thought there was going to be a sex scene because I mean when she met him I, because of what she said. So, uh, how did um, I mean, is that the way you envisioned that character, or was that something the actress brought to the role? I mean, because based on that whole, somebody's got to lose their shit when they see Frankenstein's monster. Yeah, I think that, well, with that character specifically, Cassie the Hitchhiker, you know, I did some backpacking in my time <laughs> and uh, met some road people, and, uh, you know, they definitely have a different kind of, like, way of approaching uh life and way of approaching uh the unexpected than, than we do you know they're, I mean, they're kind of used to it, living on the road and stuff so it was kind of a mixture of both that and her character that she was so uh uh cool with the uh idea of encountering the frankenstein monster but also there's a there's a there's a level to it where we're kind of like doing a little bit of tongue-in-cheek right because when you know she, she he drives up to a motorcycle she's hitchhiking she lifts up he lifts up his visor and you can see that it's a creature and she says you know i've done worse yeah that's... so it's kind of like almost like a little bit of a you know we're, we we acknowledge the the situation at the same time that we you know are trying to make the character realistic i think for like characters who kind of lose their shit with the frankenstein creature i think it's really you know at the the scenes with the uh the school children and the teacher and the boy at the beginning the opening chase yeah. i think those are really the people who are and they're more vulnerable right their kids uh, who really kind of react more like what we are uh, expect people to, but they see a, a living dead man in the woods. So the, um, the, the other ones, now this is okay. Once again, this is just me personally. Okay. Has nothing to do with the writing of the movie or anything, but now when they had to, uh, when the, the doctors who performed, um, uh, life-saving procedures fairly early mm -hmm. on in the movie, yeah. Once again, I thought they were a little too accepting of the situation. When that guy showed up as an accident victim, um, okay, then, then I, I, I don't want to give any spoilers away, but the doctors do typical life-saving stuff on him, and I'm thinking, yeah. I wouldn't touch that son of a <laughs> bitch. Um, so, you know. Yeah, I think that with that, I think with that, you know, obviously part of it is when you're making a Frankenstein movie, you're making a movie about, you know, someone who's reanimated from the dead and he's covered in stars. And there's kind of like that part that you just, you know, one of the big things that I was concerned about in the movie was the scene where he meets the actress at a restaurant. When Jason Frankenstein goes to a restaurant and he meets this actress there and they have a conversation. She asks him, what's his name? And he says, Jason Frankenstein. And, you know, I was always concerned if that was just going to get a laugh because, you know, the, the the everything that goes into that name. right it, it was it was a hard road realized... it was a hard road to follow but now that the Mar now that marvel's introduced the multiverse yeah there doesn't yeah. have to be a mary shelley's frankenstein now he's just, yeah <laughs> that's true but it's it's really hard he's to write the name now <laughs> it, uh, no i thought i thought that same... yeah but I, th I think go ahead oh no i was gonna say i, I think that eventually you realize it's a Frankenstein movie. People know that going in. So they're willing to buy like things like the creature in the hospital and the doctors interacting with him, even though he looks like a creature, you know, it's just kind of, it's, it's kind of like part and parcel with it. And also part of that too was, you know, making sure that we shoot, showed the creature at the hospital after he arrived. So like we didn't have to deal with those initial reactions to him. 
and by now he's been there for a little while. And also leading into the fact like the main doctor who deals with the creature, that that is supposed to embody every uh, asshole emergency room doctor I've ever met in my life who just does not care whatsoever <laughs> about the patient and just wants to go home. So there's a little bit of that in there too. So. Uh, no, okay, yeah, on the on the on the actress in the bar, you're absolutely right. Movies take a certain amount of suspension of disbelief. That that's the rule when you yeah. go to a movie. Um, the but the the whole the whole let's bring back the guy the 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 guy that's flatlining. Oh, by the way, he's already a decomposed corpse. That one. <laughs> but then again but it played into the way you had directed the other characters so mm -hmm. it wasn't i don't want to say it was surprising but it the the surprise only lasted a few moments because of, well you know hey yeah. <laughs> these it's, a, it's like when terrifier <laughs> pulls out a gun you go yeah i get it okay uh chad over <laughs> to you and what you have to remember is 2021 we can't bully people based on their appearance so they have to <laughs> maintain a calm demeanor around him even though he looks a little different okay okay I'll, I'll, grant you hours, yes, you know? I'll grant you that yes i'll grant you david tell me some of the uh challenges you had in making this movie uh you know the biggest challenge is post-production really um we you know we had our challenges while filming definitely but we had a really great you know support network of from our Kickstarter backers to the cast and the crew, all just putting ridiculous hours. But frankly, when we got to post, ran out of money. And uh, so I really, you know, I had to end up editing it myself, which I had not used the software in some time. Um, and it was the first feature I ever edited. And, you know, after the edit was done uh, and a couple passes of that, then it was kind of like, as the money, as I was able to raise the money, bring in the colorist, bring in the composer, bring in the, uh, sound effects designer. So really it was the post-production that seemed the most daunting to just make sure, you know, because it's also your first feature. So you don't want to just get it out just to get it out because you know that it'll really have a lot of effect on whether or not you can get backing for your next feature and what people will think of it. So that was for me the biggest, uh, uh, the most daunting thing I faced in the film was just the entire post-production process. Uh how did you find the actors? Were these uh, people you knew, or uh, did you go for a for a casting? No, uh, so the top like half dozen people in the opening credits are from the New York City area, and the most of pretty much everyone else is uh, in the local to me, which I live kind of in the greater capital district of New York State. So if you're familiar with like Albany, Schenectady, stuff like that. Uh, you know, we would have gotten as many local people as we could have, but there just wasn't really the demographics we needed in terms of age, frankly, for a lot of the lead characters. So that's why we pulled some of them from the city. And then um, we did do uh, casting, we did auditions, uh, and also had some people, uh, emails, uh, reels and stuff. And then uh, Bob Dix and Jim Bolson, who are the actors in the film who kind of were more veterans of uh, cult cinema, they were people who I approached uh, for their roles. Because it really meant a lot to me to have you know, I'm a big fan of that era of filmmaking, and it really meant a lot to me to have someone connected to that era in the film. So it was really good that we got those two guys on board, too. Well, it ended up being a great cast. It really came together. Oh, thanks. So. Thank you. So yeah, I they knocked that apart. Uh, we are buttoning up on our next break, so let's toss over, and we'll be back in just a moment. Spirit Mechanics is here to help. Their background includes many different specialties across the metaphysical spectrum, including alchemy, shamanism, Celtic witchcraft, angelic magic, astral travel, and more. With over 30 years combined experience in the group, you can be confident in their ability to help. If there is a question you have that you cannot answer, they will do their best to assist you. Metaphysics can be intimidating, confusing, and unfortunately, abused. Spirit Mechanics takes pride in being selfless in the pursuit of helping others, being humble and honest with their clients about their questions, and lastly maintaining a professional and personable atmosphere. They want you to feel as you are coming to a close friend and they will do everything in their power to make you comfortable and safe. And hello everyone and welcome back to Scarefest Television. I promised you a celebrity announcement for tonight and I got one. 
Coming up for Scarefest 2022, Larry Zerner, Larry Zerner, Friday the 13th, Part 3. Also, he uh, he was in, well, he was in Death House, and I'm going to tell you, I don't think they should even put that on anybody's credits. I'm sorry, I, I did not like Death House. So, there, I said it. Um, But, uh, yeah, he, he played, uh, he's got several other credits to his name, uh, stage by frame. Uh, uh, he played uh, the janitor and all the creatures were stirring. So he's got some horror cred, but his main thing is Friday the 13th, part three, where he played Shelly. And was that Finkelstein? Yeah, she Shelly Finkelstein. I just saw it here. Uh, also, if, you got, if you're a fan of the game, Friday the 13th game, he did the voice. Uh, he's not credited in the in the uh, film, in the uh, credits for the uh, game, but yes, he did do the voiceover for that. Anyway, okay, now uh, coming up next. Hey, if you want to be part of the Scarefest this year, we are now taking our staff applications. Our staff applications are open. Go to thescarefest.com, click volunteers, and uh, join us. Hey, we we could use double easily what we had last year. Um, so. Uh, there's that. And then don't forget, the Central Kentucky Mystical Market is coming up in two weeks. Next week, I have Beverly McChesney. She's going to come on and give us some answers from the universe. But February 5th and 6th, come to the Central Kentucky Mystical Market, Lexington's premier monthly psychic and holistic event. Okay. Um... Where okay, where are you in the uh, in the film festival circuit right now with this film? I mean, is it winding down for the film, or or is it still going strong? What what's the immediate future for the last Frankenstein? Yeah, we're uh, so we're right now we're at a, we've been accepted to eleven festivals. We still have three, I believe, to play three or four to play at, and we're still submitting though because we haven't kind of hit that like year mark of when we started submitting so the idea is probably i i you know i i haven't locked it all down yet but i'm thinking of putting up for streaming within the next couple months uh if we haven't gotten like a distribution deal i'll just do it myself and then follow that up with like a physical release mm -hmm. and uh right now i'm just kind of also working on the next you know write the next script for the next film because i really want to you know get this totally off my plate and then kind of move on to the next project um now, one thing I did want to ask you about, we, we were talking about what all cost you money. Another thing that impressed me about this film was obviously a lot of work went into the location scouting. I'm used to um, feature length independent films taking place in sometimes one place, in a, in a one, two rooms. It's obvious you put a lot of work into getting the right scenery behind everything that went on. Now, were you lucky enough to have all that in a fairly concentrated area, or what can you tell us about the location scouting that went into this? Yeah, uh, so I, the actual city I, I live in and have lived my whole life in is called Amsterdam, New York, and uh, it's, it's big film claim to fame as it's where Kirk Douglas is from. And, um, you know... Oh, I, it just really meant a lot to me to feature as much of Amsterdam as possible in the movie. And there's a lot of Amsterdam that still kind of exists in that kind of that 50s to 80s period. Uh, a, a great example, of course, is the mall, which was, you know, this, where um, Jason goes to meet the paramedics and he hands them the information about the people who he needs to have disposed of. And that mall was built in 1980 and hasn't been touched since then. And so it's still got the globe lamps and the orange carpet. And so it was just really about, you know, there are all these key locations in Amsterdam uh, that were of that era that are pristine. And uh, it was just a matter of going to each one, finding out who who owned them and, uh, you know, begging them to let me uh, film on location. Um, it, but it was a perfect marrying of both my personal history and connections to the community and my love for that, that, that era. It was like it couldn't be better to have those two things. Uh, put together and so it's just really finding every location i could that was like that the um god now this okay my next my, my my next comment on the film is going to sound like i'm just a dirty old man which is not that far off base but i want to say on the casting all the parts were cast great but i don't know how to put this other than you assembled an army of milfs the 
all of the females in the movie. That's the sequel. That's the sequel. <laughs> the army, army of milfs. Um, yeah. The all of the characters fit who you had. You know, the the casting was was right on. That that as far as I was concerned. And the reason I bring this up to the viewers is these are all beautiful women. Not all. I mean, I, I guess they are all, but I, I, they look like people you know. In other words, nobody. That's another thing. Most time when you see an independent film, they go they, if if they're the part calls for the attractive girlfriend or the actress or whatever. They usually try to go over the top, or you can tell they had no budget and they shot way too low. All, <laughs> these all all of these female characters fit right into that section of, oh, she's pretty. You know, if I'm going to take her on a date, I'd invite her to go bowling. That type of stuff. Um, <laughs> was that on purpose, or is that just who applied? I mean, what was your prerequisite, I guess, is the question, on uh, on, set on setting your cast to the actual people that applied? Yeah, um... I think that that's just really, you know, we have a very passionate, but very s relatively small uh, filmmaking community where I live. So, you know, we had the cast for 40 roles and we only got a little over a hundred submissions. So that's not really a great ratio. And so the people we have in the movie are excellent. Uh, they, they really did a great job, but it was really about, I think to, to answer your question, it's really kind of who comes in for the part. And, you know, the way I cast is, you know, obviously they have to have the, the uh, acting talent first. Um, and, and, and really, I think it was just, I think I just, without, without uh, knowing it, uh, managed to cast perfectly for your uh, sensibilities. But I, think that's what it <laughs> I would call it dumb luck. The way you just described it to me, <laughs> that was just dumb luck. Because if you, if you, if your casting ratio was that tight, to have just nailed all of these characters, you know, just, you know, the right physicality, the right looks for everything in the movie. I mean, um, I've, I'll put it this way. I've seen independent films where you can tell, you can tell they did half the writing after the people were cast. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. you know, that was yeah. not showing through here. They were just, you know, like I said, the, the, the girl next door, the, the, the lady next door, um, that's, just attractive enough not to make you go, you know, turn your head away from the screen. Um, <laughs> God, that's a terrible way to describe it. But anyway, I just an another well, I, compliment I, on the way you put it together. I think too that like, um, it's not about whether people, either the actors or the actresses, the men or the women, it's not even about whether they are they attractive or unattractive. It's about what's the look because that is part of it, right? Like they have to have the talent right. to be able to perform. But they also have, to have a certain look. I mean, again, that era I like. A lot of the actors who I like from like the seventies, the the men from the, that time period, people like you know George Kennedy, Gene Hackman, uh, you know Claude Aikens. I mean, these people were probably wouldn't be considered handsome by any kind of objective standard, but they had a great look. And so, I think that plays a part into it too. Is like, do they have the ability to uh, play this character? Yes, but they also they have that look that's going to fit into the overall. Uh, visual design of the movie, you know, be that whatever it may be. So I think that does play a part in it for sure. Okay. Chad, over to you. Talk us through some of your other projects. Um, I know you've, uh, this isn't your first directorial debut. Tell us, uh, tell us about some other stuff you've worked on in the past that people might want to go look at. Well, I don't think any of it's actually out because I'd probably be too embarrassed by it. But uh, I mean, I did a bunch of short films, um, a lot of genre stuff. Uh, the the last one I did before this was several years before it. It was uh, a short film where about uh, kind of inspired by uh, the uh, the book Helter Skelter about the Manson murders, and uh, it, it followed a, a hitchhiker and the guy who gives her a ride and uh, how, it, how they end up uh, meeting an untimely demise. But a lot of the stuff I did before this was stuff like that. It was just short films, short films in school, a couple with friends. I worked on other people's projects um, and did a little bit of uh, bonus features for a Blu-ray. So it's just kind of like a hodgepodge of stuff. 
Uh, but now I'm just kind of like going full, full bet into the uh, into features. So like the next project I'm writing right now is actually a sequel to the last Frankenstein, and uh, hoping to film that um, not this up this year because it's set in the fall, but uh, the following year. Um, so that's really where my mind's at now. I think is uh, just the feature work that's coming up, and uh, also I want to kind of get my toe a little bit into. Uh, putting out Blu-rays of older movies, uh, kind of doing some restoration work on those and getting them out. So, Great. Um, so tell us a little bit about where you are in the process for the for the sequel then. Are you in the, in uh, writing or are you in the fundraising yet? Uh, well, I'll def- if, if any fundraising comes along, I'll definitely switch to that right away. But uh, right now it's really writing. I mean, I have the story pretty well mapped out in my head, which is kind of how I write. Like I, I don't even, I don't do a lot of drafts. I really get it worked out in my head pretty well and then write it out. And then there's just kind of like minor changes. That's the way it was with the last script. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to have it done uh, at least uh, in pretty good shape within a few months. Uh, because like I said, it really needs to shoot in the late summer, early fall. So looking at 2023, really want to start getting on that fundraising soon. But yeah, I think uh, if you like the first one, I hope you like the second one. I, it's, I think it's, it's, uh, it basically mixes what you saw in the last Frankenstein with a 1970s prison movie. If that gives you any indication of what it's going to be like. So uh, I hope people will uh, respond to it. Based on Wes's last segment, he's hoping it's an all women's prison. And... <laughs> I'd watch it. Especially with your cast. I'd watch it. Yeah, I'd watch it. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, what, what are you doing? Are you working on any other projects? Yeah, um, I am the Jay Leonard, the producer on The Last Frankenstein. He and I are going to be launching a podcast soon. We've recorded about half a dozen episodes of that. Just a film, just a you know general umbrella film related uh, podcast. Um, and he just uh, is finishing wrapping up a film he directed. So I'm kind of just like you know I don't have any direct involvement in that, but a lot of just kind of like you know putting heads together, watching it, giving feedback. And like I said, uh, you know, I really want to get into some film restoration work. I actually purchased uh, a movie from the 70s uh, called UFO Target Earth. It was this uh, sci-fi horror exploitation film shot in Georgia. And I was able to uh, actually purchase the copyright and the negative from the director. So uh, I have been in talks with him. and want to get that restored and uh, released on Blu-ray and get that done. So those are kind of like the main three things, the podcasting, the sequel, and then uh, getting this uh, 70s movie restored and released. Be, be an interesting project on the restoration i'd be interested to hear more about that as you get a little closer on that yeah it's been really fascinating so far just to, like talking it's amazing just to talk to the director because i've seen a couple of his other works and uh yeah i'm looking forward to do the commentary track with him hopefully in a couple months so. i think we're just about up to the next break so we'll see you in just a few moments hey scarefest fans this is joe lewis of bonehead weekly here with another review. This one is a mini series and it's an adaptation or a limited series based on Stephen King's book, The Outsider, called The Outsider. Now it's got Ben Mendelsohn in it, who's a fantastic character actor, and he plays the lead detective. And what happens is, is that he's a no, not necessarily a no-nonsense guy, but he's very, you know, things are real. Everything's tangible. He believes in science and detective work. He arrests a guy played by Jason Bateman who he thinks murdered this child. There is DNA evidence. There is eyewitnesses after the scene of the crime. But the problem is, is that Jason Bateman's character, we find out, was also in another spot 100 miles or 200 miles away, and he couldn't be in both places. So how is that possible? And then we have another character, Holly Gibney, who comes in, who, if you read Stephen King, is from the other Mr. Mercedes books, whom is a great character, by the way. And she kind of starts to explain what this could be. Is it a creature? Is it not a creature? And the miniseries just kind of develops on, are they following something? Is it supernatural? Or is it something that maybe existed all along? It's not really supernatural. It's just something we don't know about. I can't recommend it enough. If the writing is fantastic. The acting is fantastic. I love Ben Mendelsohn and everything. He's a great character actor. But... What I love about it is that they did a great adaptation of what Stephen King, a lot of people get Stephen King things wrong. And what I mean by that is 
they take the story but they leave the character and the thing is about Stephen King what he's really good at is character three-dimensional believable characters that's the reason why his books normally work the outsider was my last of his books that I really enjoyed I haven't particularly cared for the last two or three and all the characters are three-dimensional and honestly this adaptation I'm not saying it's better than the book. It's not, but it's just as good. And in places, I enjoyed it more. Not that it's better. I just enjoyed it more. I loved it. It's on HBO Max called The Outsider. You really should check it out. It's a murder mystery. It may or may not have a creature in it. It's a little bit of a slow burn, but the acting and writing is just great. So check it out, The Outsider. This has been Joe Lewis of Bonehead Weekly. It's on HBO Max. And welcome back, everybody, to the last segment of Scarefest Radio, Scarefest TV, for this evening. There have been some respectable fan-made Friday the 13th projects lately, but ever wonder about the lack of an official franchise project since the 2009 remake? It's because the franchise has been tied up in ongoing lawsuits over film rights. Victor Miller, the original Friday the 13th screenwriter, filed a lawsuit to gain control of the franchise, which has tied up any official productions. Miller currently owns the domestic rights to the young Jason, while Sean Cunningham owns the adult Mask Jason, but can't use him without Miller's permission. So, how do you stop an invincible killing machine? You issue a court order. Um, okay. Uh, David, a couple of things to finish up with here. Then, then me and Chad are going to address the the uh, hubbub in the chat room the best we can. The um, which, spoiler alert, it's about the the what they're doing down in the convention center. The um, okay. Um, uh, when did you actually do the filming on the movie, David? Yeah, we actually shot it from. The second half of 2015 and a little bit in the beginning of 2016. Okay. Yep. Pre-COVID. And then it's the post. Like, the <laughs> okay. Pre- oh, yes. Yeah. Pre-COVID. Yes. Um, you remember that, right? Oh, yeah. A little bit. Well, see, a lot of our... I was actually worried about our film festival because, honestly, some of the early entries showed they were filmed in 2019 so badly that i mean it, it actually became it was becoming a cliche i can't tell you how many zoom meetings yeah. people had the idea of do, doing a zoom meeting movie and it, it, it finally it wore thin quickly if i'd gotten one or two of them you know it might have been different uh now people who want to see your film before you get it out on streaming tell them how to find your film david sure uh the two best places to stay in touch with us are our facebook page which is just the last frankenstein we try to update several times a week. There's also links there to like our website. And then the website itself, is, which is where we keep a schedule of all the festival and screening events coming up. That's uh, www.gila-film.com. So that's G-I-L-A-F-I-L-M.com. And that has other social media links too. So if you just hit up the Facebook page, that can take you to the website. And then the website will take you under like Instagram and Twitter. I am. Um, now, we're going we're gonna to go to the all and make David sit through this bullshit. Everybody... I saw it on the news tonight for the first time. I think I'd heard some hubbub about it, but now the... (laughs) Okay. Ask anybody why they don't want to go to downtown Lexington if they don't don't go down there. And they'll tell you it's because parking sucks. I'm sorry, parking sucks. Especially if you have a UK game or, you know, anything going on at the convention center. That's our biggest... I'd say that, except for the concession stands this year, that was our biggest complaint. And that's, but everybody knows it's out of our control. So if that's your complaint, Lexington Tourism Council, what do you do? You build a soccer stadium across the street from your busiest venue in Lexington in the park. The new soccer team is going to be sponsored by Uber. <laughs> That's actually a very cogent point. Everybody contact the Lexington Fayette Urban County Government. They have a website, LFCUG something. Uh, but look it up, Urban County Government. 
Fayette County, Lexington, Kentucky, however you got to find them, tell them what a tragically bad idea this is. Okay, I will take them on their word they're going to build this huge, huge parking structure that they've been promising us since they even brought up remodeling the whole damn thing and, and, and tearing out one of the parking lots to put a homeless shelter. I mean, park. But I saw the artist rendering tonight, Chad. They did the artist rendering of the soccer stadium, and it's like facing Vine Street. Is that Vine? Is that yeah? Uh, facing, facing the freaking convention center. It's a long center. way away. Do what? Yeah, the parking's going to be a long way away. Yeah. So even if they build the parking garage, they'll have to put it like in Nick Nicholasville now. It's it's incredible, everybody. So just tell them, do not do away with the parking spaces. Build build a nice parking structure, which is bad enough because while they're building a parking structure, guess what they'll have to rip up? Parking lot. But at least maybe I've I, I don't I don't understand. Everybody in the chat room, I saw you talking about it. I do not understand what they're thinking. And and Lexington is so famous for their soccer interest. It's we're getting two teams, aren't we? Didn't I see that? Make him play in the fucking baseball stadium. Shit, you draw the lines a different way, you're done. It's got a big parking lot. It used to be a, it used to be a mall. There's plenty of parking over there. I'm just saying. This I'm surprised too. I didn't expect that that's where they were going to put it, but it's gonna, like you said, it's going to be a mess. They even if they build a parking garage, it's not going to be. Easy. You're going to have to go around the stadium, based on where that rendering shows it, to get yeah. to Rupp Arena. So that's not only a problem for conventions like us. That's going to be an issue for basketball games. Yeah, as near as I can tell, according to the artist rendering. You will not even be able to see the convention center from where they're planning on having you park. I mean, cause soccer stadiums are not small. I mean, you, if you're if they're worth building, they're worth building big enough. Yeah, it, it'll be. It's just, it's incredible, people. Of course, now this is not on the horizon. It's in the early planning stages, so don't take this as a oh no, don't come to Skirfest this October. No, 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 nothing like that. We're just saying this is the time to. Maybe con if you're if you live in Lexington, maybe contact your whatever the hell you call them down there. Urban County Council members. That's what it's called. There you go. And tell them this is a horrendous idea. It is poorly thought out. And we need more parking spaces. There. Now. Shit. There's your show for the evening, everybody. Um little little unplanned acrobatics here. Uh, next week, once again, Beverly McChesney is coming on to do her uh, messages from the universe thing. What we'll be doing next week, and I'll describe this better when we broad when we uh, advertise the episode, we're actually going to be monitoring the chat room for you to ask questions of the universe. It's always a great show when Beverly is on, so I'm looking forward to that one. And tonight, if you weren't paying attention or you just tuned in. I mean, people do that on Facebook. Anyway, the point is, our guest tonight has been David Weaver. He is the filmmaker behind our best kill of 2021 at the film festival, The Last Frankenstein. People, it is worth a watch if you can get somewhere to see it before it comes out streaming. Do it. It's, it's, it, it is, it's worth a watch. It's a very great effort on an independent film. It fits all of my personal things that I like, uh, except there was no nudity and with the female cast involved. Uh, that's... The Army of Mills. <laughs> the Army of Mills. By God, if that comes out, I want credit. If you do that movie in the future, <laughs> David, I want I want in the credits. Everybody, this has been Scarefest TV. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. <laughs>